if that's breached, then the stuff is getting into your brain and screwing up the brain chemistry uh, in a way that it wouldn't wouldn't happen if the blood-brain barrier was not being broken. And it gets broken by pesticide and, and herbicide. It gets broken by bacteria and viruses. So the whole thing is re- readily opened up and lets toxins into the brain in a way that is not going to do you a lot of, your brain a lot of good or my brain a lot of good either. Right. The, the, the way that the cells work is what I call tight cell junction, so the cells stick very close together. And so fingers got to go through the cell or stay outside. But if these tight cell junctions get opened up, stuff can go around the cell and get behind the other tissues. And this seems to be to happen whenever you breach tight cell junctions. If you do it in the lungs or in the gut, which we, uh, the IAG story tells us about, then it's going to happen everywhere else. So there's real problems once that sort of process has been set in motion. Uh, those are just some examples, really. You can read them quicker than I can tell you about them. Blood flow is reduced in the brain. A lot of people looked at blood flow and blood perfusion uh, in different parts of the brain and found in ME, certain areas are, uh, the blood flow is lower. Uh, particularly in the brain stem, uh, is one that John Richardson identified in his book. But this is something to do with the the insular cortex, which is controls the smooth muscle of the gut. So you know, if your insular cortex is sort of not happy, the gut's not going to be happy. And in a separate study, that's a paper that came out in 2002 from, Sydney, from a Sydney conference. But in a separate study, 20% reduction in blood flow in the left temporal lobe, uh, which controls access to language in younger patients. And that was done by Richard uh, Burnett in Adelaide. So, this is the evidence that the dysfunctional brain is ex- being expressed in the gut and in language, uh, which you all know is the case. But the evidence is there. Don't have to go over it. This is the neuroendocrine immune system. What I've been se- talking about, the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system, all interacting, all sending messages to each other. And these... This is something that's fairly recently been appreciated in its, uh, its impact, and it's not got into modern medicine yet. Sometimes called psychoneuroimmune. It's like I want to be in on it. Uh, so these messenger molecules are, are sending molecules to all these systems. It's not just one of them. They are intercommunicating, and when you think about it, if we didn't work like that, we would be in serious trouble, wouldn't we? And this is, this is one that shows you that diesel fumes alter the immune cell balance. If you're inhaling diesel fumes, you can alter the immune cell balance. How does that work? Because the diesel fumes go straight to the brain. Some will go into the lungs. But, you know, how do these messages get around? How do these messages get around the body? And it's through these interconnecting pathways between the immune system, the um, neuroendocrine immune system. This is what it looks like in the brain. The pituitary is a big player in this, the hypothalamus up here. These are the things we're looking at inside here, the basal ganglia and the limbic system. Uh, and down here is the adrenal glands. So that's the stress axis, straight out the brain, through the adrenal. And that's ser- seriously compromising many people with ME. Get very poor uh, stimulation, response to stimulation of the adrenal glands. This is a better picture, it's more complicated, but it shows how we behave. This is a challenge which comes in. This is a, a schematic, really. And it can come in through the mind, through external environmental factors like light and temperature, or through microbial pathogens and tumour cells in the body, and autoantigens generated in the body. This is the immune system. This is the endocrine system. This is the, CN, the brain and the pineal gland, which is a major controlling gland inside the brain, linked to the pituitary and the hypothalamus, hypothalamus and the pituitary. These OPs are not organophosphates, but opioids, which are help part of the interconnecting network of messengers, which are sending signals around the brain. Do you think that looks complicated? <laughs> Look at this one. This is another representation of a more recent paper, and this is giving you the different communicating molecules. These are the endorphins, which are opioids. These are interferons from the immune system. These are thymic peptides, which control... Uh, the maturation of immune cells in the body. <coughs> this is ACTH, which stimulates the, the, uh, the, the adrenals to put out uh, uh, cortisol. Uh, these are immune system markers as well, and modulators. 
So we've got here a huge set of interconnecting communicating systems, all speaking to each other uh, by these chemical messengers. If that gets disrupted, we can anticipate it, what it would look like, really. I can't play with a ball of wool, really. <laughs> Getting an awful tangle. The other thing is chronic fatigue syndrome and genes and infection. This guy is one of the big guys of, uh, in America, Pataka Montero. He's in a very interesting study, and he's found a defective gene in patients with ME who are unable to mount a proper response to natural infection. So there's a genetic component behind this. It also regulates phosphate and bone metabolism. In many Gulf War veterans, we're finding osteoporosis. Do people... Are any, I don't like asking questions about it because I don't want you to identify it. But if, if people have got any sign of osteoporosis, it might be related to their ME through this genetic pathway. And autoimmune diseases are also affected by this genetic function. And it's known to be dysfunctional or non-functional in, in, in some cases. And at least one case I'm dealing with seems to be... Uh, implicated in this sort of problem.